Welcome to another Beyond Access series, everyone. And for those of uh, who have joined us before, welcome back. Uh, tonight, we're excited to have Sandy Long from the Child Mind Institute here with us. Uh, but before we go into that presentation, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, Tonight, as in every night, you have the ability to ask your questions using the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. If you've never used it before, you should be, see it as a button on your screen that says has the letter Q&A um, with some speech bubbles directly above it. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll be uh, answering questions that we can. Um, and then we have some dedicated time towards the end to go through some questions and answer them live. Um, so please feel free to to dropping your questions throughout uh, the day. Uh, we are recording this and we will be uploading it to the YouTube channel tomorrow. So uh, if you're interested in, in watching it over or sharing it with friends who couldn't make it tonight, you'll have that opportunity, absolutely. Um, so tonight, as I said, we're here another night with the Child Mind Institute with Sandy Long, and we're excited because Sandy's going to share with you all easy to use tips and strategies for how to create a positive home environment where your children are validated in their emotional experiences and given the tools to cope effectively through times of anxiety and stress. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but I think that's highly, highly uh, needed these days. So we're so excited that Sandy's here with us. So without any further ado, I'm handing it over to Sandy. Hi, welcome. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to learn more about how to support your child's social, emotional, and mental health. I'm, the, I'm going to start screen sharing now. Okay. So it should be full screen. Uh, welcome to today's talk, Promoting Social Emotional Wellbeing. My name is Sandy Long. I am a social worker at, in the school and community programs here at Child Mind Institute. And before we jump into today's topic, I just want to give a quick overview of our work here at Child Mind Institute. We have three branches. So firstly, there's clinical care. We provide evidence-based treatments to children with mental health and learning disorders be that in our offices, virtually, or in schools, which is what I primarily do in our school and community programs. Secondly, we have research. So we conduct neuroscience research to improve and individualize treatments for children. And then thirdly, we're committed to public mental health education. So we provide talks, workshops, online resource guides to caregivers, educators and policymakers to end the stigma around mental health and help connect children to clinical care earlier. Um, so in today's talk, we're going to be spending most of our time discussing preventative principles that's going to guide you in creating a warm and positive home environment. And then we're also going to talk through specific activities, family routines, and conversation ideas that you can immediately put to use at home to help build up your child's social and emotional skills. And at the end, if we have some time, I'm going to provide some quick reminders on prioritizing your self-care and mental health. Um, but since this stress management topic was explored in last week's talk, I won't spend too much time on that. And then at the end again, as discussed, we're going to have some time for Q&A. So feel free to type your thoughts and questions into the Q&A box throughout the talk. Okay, before we go into some of the guiding principles and specific skills, what is mental health? You can think of mental health as your overall well-being. So that includes how you're doing emotionally and psychologically. Um, so how have you been feeling recently? How's your mood? How's your self-esteem? How do you deal with tough, tough situations? And that's the very typical idea of mental health we have. Mental health though, it also includes social well-being. So that is how are your relationships with family, with friends? Do you have a solid support system in your life? And then finally, mental health includes physical health and biological factors. So a person can be born with or develop disabilities. Um, they can have a family history that 
increases their chances of experiencing a mental illness, or they might just be more vulnerable to certain stressors because maybe in the past couple of weeks, they haven't been getting enough sleep, um, they haven't been getting their regular exercise. Knowing that these three factors affect mental health lets us know where and how to take action to improve overall mental health. So we are going to start by talking through ways to set up your home environment to create this kind of buffer zone, this protective armor um, for mental health, just knowing that life, it's going to throw challenges and some stressful changes. So this slide, it provides an overview of what you wanna be doing at home to create this strong foundation for positive mental health. I'm gonna explain each of these in more detail in the next slides, but very briefly, you are establishing healthy daily and weekly routines. You're building in quality one-on-one -on -one time to bond with your child and really strengthen your relationship with them. You're modeling the behaviors and core values you wanna see in your child, and you're supporting their social and emotional learning. Okay, so firstly, um, you wanna support your child in creating consistent morning and evening routines. So what does that look like? Um, you really wanna be thinking about the physical health piece of mental health. So think about yourself, when you're well rested, um, you're eating regularly, you fit in your daily workout or your afternoon walk, it's more likely that you'd be in a better mood and better mental state that week. This is the same with your children. Children really thrive on consistency and structured yet balanced days and weeks. So they need enough sleep based on their age range. So you kind of work back from, backwards from when they have to leave for school in the morning, fill in when dinner time is, when, when bath time is, when it's time to turn off screens and get ready for bed. Children also need physical activity. So you can encourage this by riding bikes together as a family, maybe having dance competitions with the younger kids or being supportive and showing up to your teenager's basketball or soccer games. And then children like everyone else need a healthy and balanced diet. They also really benefit from having downtime. So there's time for homework and extracurricular activities, but then there's also time to relax, to hang out with people, read for fun, not just for school, watch TV. And when a child has, while well, a child does have choice during this unstructured time, you do wanna set clear expectations around screen use. So some considerations uh, might include setting time limits, maybe a digital curfew before bedtime. Maybe there are screen-free zones at the dinner table and just knowing in general what content your child's consuming, what social media platforms they're on so that you can have conversations, conversations about what's on TV, what's on their phone, what's on these websites. For a strong child-parent relationship, it's also important to build in quality one-on-one -on -one time. So this is dedicated time to get to know your child better, to create memories, to have conversations. And according to research, the amount of time is less important than your state of mind, level of engagement, and your openness to communication. So just five minutes each day can be enough. And to make the most of the five minutes, you're gonna to wanna to let your child choose the activity or lead the conversation. So the younger kids are gonna to want to play with maybe their stuffed animals or board games. The older kids might wanna show you their favorite TikTok videos or their drawings of cartoon characters. Teenagers, they might wanna talk about friends or how their favorite class or after school club is going. So let your child lead. And during this one-on-one -on -one time, try to avoid commands, asking a ton of questions or making any critical statements. Instead, what you're doing is you're accepting and validating their interests and their choices. You're giving them lots of positive attention towards what you like and ignoring any minor misbehaviors. The goal here in this one-on-one -on -one time is just to show that your child that you accept them as they are 
that you love and support them deeply, and that there's always time in the day for the two of you to bond, to chat. And so when the, the time comes that they are feeling stressed out about something, they know that they can talk to you and come to you. Now, in terms of behaviors and character traits that you want your child to embody, remember the old saying, monkey see, monkey do. You are a major influence on your child. So the next time you're having a stressful moment, you can try modeling emotional vulnerability. So as an example, it can be, I am feeling scared about the COVID variant especially when I'm riding the trains or buses. And then you wanna talk through your child any problem solving and coping skills you're using. Um, and then for situations that maybe can't be problem solved or changed like COVID, at that point you're showing your resilience and ability to handle tough situations and unpleasant feelings. So for instance, um, instead of feeling more and more scared to the point where I don't wanna be outside at all, I paused and I thought about what is in my control versus what's not in my control. So what's in my control, I can wear these masks. I can maybe ask my boss about working from home. I can take deep breaths and tell myself, I've been through this fear before. I've been through this uncertainty before. In addition to modeling ways of responding to stressful events and dealing with emotions, you can also directly put a ton of positive attention on behaviors you like. So we, when you are praising your child, aim to be specific. Think about and then clearly communicate to your child what you expect from them. What behavior do you want them to be doing more of? So rather than go to bed soon, it's brush your teeth by 7.50 p.m. and change into PJs by 7.55 p.m. And then you wanna praise your child right after they finish brushing their teeth. You also wanna be physically close to them when you're giving this praise. So after you see that they're in their PJs, you're not shouting, oh, that's awesome from down the hallway because they don't know what's awesome. Now you're yelling at them right before bedtime. Um, just try to be close to them when giving this praise. You also want to be sincere and use nonverbal signs of approval. So smiling, giving eye contact, praising with a warm tone of voice. No sarcasm or like finally, thanks, I guess, for doing that after I told you a hundred times. Instead, you're trying to praise specifically, uh, praise consistently and specifically. Um, so every time they do these bedtime behaviors, you state your appreciation. You're aiming to praise at a fairly high dose. So that means ideally for every potential one negative comment or one direct command, you're providing at least four pieces of positive feedback to your child. Okay. So we have just gone through principles to keep in mind when praising behaviors you want in your child. We're now gonna go through some more specific examples to make these guidelines really clear. So you can start by thinking about problem behaviors. These are on the left side of the column here. And then you're gonna think about the positive opposites. So that's on the right side of the column. So for example, when your child is disobeying you, the positive behavior that you want more of is your child listening to you. And even more specific than that, you want your child to be following directions after you say them. Another example, problem behavior is maybe your child interrupting in conversations. So the positive opposite, what you want them to do is to wait their turn to speak, um, maybe raise their hand if that's um, the rule in classrooms. One more example, if the problem behavior is they're hitting, their sibling, the positive opposite, what you want them to do is to keep their hands to themselves, um, maybe to ask politely and for what they want. So some examples of effective positive feedback um, could be, thank you for listening while I speak to you, or 
great job waiting so patiently for me to get off the phone. Um, when you're able to identify these positive opposites, the behaviors that you want to increase, you know what to be on the lookout for, you know what to specifically praise as soon as you see it, and then you can say these things sincerely and consistently. Okay. So, so far we've talked about modeling what you want to see in your child. Um, we've talked about how you can give positive attention, be that in the quality one-on-one -on -one time or in the specific praising of behaviors you expect. You're also keeping in mind the biological and physical health piece of mental health by setting up these balanced routines. Another piece of mental health though is social health. And that's something that you can also positively impact by strengthening your relationship with your child. Um, so while you're using these ideas to start shaping your child's behavior, at the same time, it doesn't feel great if all the interactions with your child are around like changing what they're doing. So it's very important to find small moments in the day to acknowledge and affirm your child's inherent worth as a human being. So you can say something like, I'm so happy to be spending time with you or I missed you today and I thought about you while you were gone, or your fun energy is so infectious. So the more specific these positive affirmations are to your child, the better. And just know that all the love that's in your heart, let your child know regularly. If they like hugs, you can give them lots of hugs too. Um, another way of Another way to improve your relationship is to positively acknowledge your child's interests. So this might be what they engage in in their downtime. So you can try to join in when they're playing a video game or watching a TV show. And even if this thing is not something that's up your alley, you can at least genuinely say, so nice to hear you laughing and I'm glad you can unwind with this comedy show after a long day at school. Thanks for sharing this with me. You don't have to ask a bunch of questions, just know that your presence and your availability is creating space for your child to talk to you when they want to about the topics they wanna to go into. And also when you're not making every interest feel like a potential career path, or are you really serious about this sport? Um, you're letting, you're creating space to let them explore activities and hobbies that can also just be for fun. Okay, one more major tip on strengthening the relationship with your child is to use validation. What is that? It's communicating to the person that you're listening to that her feelings, thoughts, and actions make sense, that that is understandable given the situation. You're not necessarily agreeing with or approving of what that person did, but you can see how in their position, feeling angry or feeling scared, that's a normal reaction. Now, the opposite of that, invalidation, it communicates to the other person that his emotions, what he's thinking, his behaviors, they don't make sense. So that's a stupid idea. Why did you do that? Or you're only crying to get something out of me. This invalidation, it can be expressed intentionally, so that's through what we say, or it might be unintentional. So it could be that I'm having a busy day, and when my child starts talking to me about friendship drama at school, maybe I'm tuning them out, maybe I'm not making eye contact, maybe I'm hurrying off to make dinner, and then I forget to follow up on the conversation. Now, in this case, my inattention, it makes sense, given my busy day, but from my child's perspective, this kind of invalidation is painful and hurtful and they would be rightfully upset with me. So you can see how, can, you can see how validation has many benefits. You show that you're listening to your child without any judgment. You're conveying that you understand them and gradually they're going to trust you more. They're gonna be more willing to share troubles and take the risk of sharing maybe feelings or thoughts that they might be embarrassed about. 
So to make this even more clear, I want to share some examples of invalidation versus validation. So if the situation is your child expresses worry about how he's going to do on his math test, an invalidating statement might be, don't worry, you'll do fine. You're a great math student. On the other hand, a validating statement could be, it's understandable that you're worried about it, and I know how hard you've been working in that class. Another situation, maybe your teen is upset about the curfew that you have set for them, and they say, oh, it's so unfair. My friends all have later curfews. An invalidating statement could be, well, I'm not their parent, and what I say goes. Validating statement is, I can see that you're very upset, and I know how important time with friends is to you. And at the same time, this is the curfew that I'm comfortable with. So with this example, you can see how you're still sticking to your limit as a parent, but you're not antagonizing your teenager. You're, you're showing that you, you understand their position and their value of friendship. And one more example here, your child shares a recent conflict with friends at school. Something invalidating might be, well, they're not worth your time anyway, you can make new friends. Validating statement would be, wow, that's gotta be really frustrating for you. I know you've been friends with them for a long time. I can see why you'd be upset and kind of thinking about this a lot. Okay. Um, so we have now gotten to the second part of our talk today. At this point, I wanna emphasize that if you can do several or many of the preventative principles we went through, you're already doing a lot to create this strong foundation for positive mental health. In the next slides, I'm gonna be providing an overview of additional social and emotional skills that you can teach and practice with your child. So very briefly, some of the benefits of learning these social emotional skills. One, you're normalizing having all sorts of emotions and you're normalizing talking about thoughts and feelings at home. Two, you can teach and these skills to your child and you can also prompt them to use skills effectively to handle situations that come up or manage emotions. Three, um, the more skills and practice that your child has, the more they realize that they have choice in how they think and act. And then four, you're creating a safe environment at home where you know, we get to be human, we get to have our feelings, maybe fall apart a bit, talk through problems, get some perspective, relax and recharge. And then finally, you are destigmatizing mental health. And what that means is should these men should these coping skills not be enough for a certain stressor or for a general period of time? Um, this is the case with seasonal depression or for a lot of people right now, the ongoing pandemic and quarantining again is very tough. So for these cases, letting your child know that, you know, sometimes we can't figure it out on our own. And in, this, in addition to supportive friends and family, we may need professional mental health support, and that is okay. And in fact, it's a brave thing to be able to acknowledge and ask for. So we are now going to run through six core social emotional skills. These are feelings identification, relaxation skills, managing thoughts, managing big emotions, social problem solving, and mindfulness. To provide some context, these six skills are taught in our mental health skill building workshops. So through the school and community programs at Child Mind Institute, clinicians like myself, we go into classrooms throughout New York City. We cover each of the skills and practice them with students over six weeks. So this is like a mental health class. It's once a week at school and we tailor the curriculum for elementary, middle, and high school students. So if you know that your child's school is rece receiving this curriculum, great, your child is learning this at school. And if not, and you're interested in this, you can speak with your school social worker or guidance counselor, 
and talk to them about bringing mental health skill building to the classroom. Okay, so we'll start with our first key skill and that is understanding feelings. So to increase awareness of emotions, you can start by identifying and labeling them with your child. So for instance, you can use specific praise when your child identifies feelings in themselves or in other people. So nice job noticing you're feeling frustrated or that was so kind to notice that your brother was feeling sad and asking him how he, how he can help. You can also practice identifying how someone else is feeling or identifying where your child feels emotions in their bodies. So maybe when reading books together, oh, how do you think this character is feeling in this picture? You know, based on what their face looks like, what their body posture is like, or maybe when watching the latest Marvel movie, oh, what is that character doing that makes you think he's feeling mad right now? You can ask a follow-up question like, where do you feel mad in your body? And then when appropriate, you can also share how you are feeling too. So um, you can let your child know that it's possible to experience more than one emotion at a time and in a day, and that we feel our emotions at different intensities, which means different amounts. So as an example could be, oh, I started my day feeling pretty joyful because I got to eat my favorite breakfast. My friend called me at lunch though, and then they had to cancel our plans for tonight. So then I was feeling sad and mad at the same time. I felt a little mad, it was more like annoyed, but more so sad. Those were a couple of the emotions I felt today, but enough about me, tell me about your day. So in these discussions about feelings, you're modeling how to talk about feelings yourself. And then you can also ask your child open-ended questions, can actively listen, reflect back what they're saying and validate their emotions. Next up are relaxation skills. So these work by calming down the body to calm down the mind. So while taking some deep breaths or stretching, it's not gonna make math class or English class go away, but it might help turn down the intensity of worrying about grades and tests maybe just enough to fall asleep and try a new study plan for tomorrow. Some other relaxation techniques could include belly breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and guided imagery. So for all of these and for even more relaxation skills, you can Google scripts and how to's for them. They're really great, simple activities to practice with your child in a calm moment. And again, this would be a really great opportunity to provide that specific praise on their willingness to practice with you. And then you can talk through with them. Oh, how was that for you? If they're feeling calmer now, maybe they're even feeling a little sleepy. Um, you can ask, oh, when might you use this relaxation skill in the future? For what situations or for what emotions might this be helpful with? The next skill is managing thoughts. Um, this was, again, extensively covered in last week's talk, um, but some of the key points were the cognitive triangle shown here and common thinking traps that we all fall into from time to time. This triangle, it shows that our thoughts, our cognitions, um, our feelings and emotions and our behaviors, which is what we do, they're all connected to each other. So if we can change our thoughts about a situation, we might change how we feel about it and what we end up doing. Um, so as an example, say the situation is your child has a school project due next week. They might have a thought like, this work is impossible. And then they would be feeling frustrated, hopeless, maybe confused about what to do. And their behavior in that case would be to give up and just play video games maybe they're going to like stop into their room and just not try at all. On the other hand, if they have a thought like, well, I've done hard things before and I can just try my best. In that case, they'd be feeling hopeful, maybe a bit calmer, motivated. And their behaviors in that case could be, 
maybe I can ask my teacher for help tomorrow or just finish and do as much as I can. So you can see how in this example, the first thought we might have about an event, it could be very extreme, like, oh, I'm definitely going to fail the project. And that kind of thought would lead to really strong, intense emotions. Um, this first thought, though, it might not be the most realistic or that helpful to us. So the skill here is supporting your child and recognizing in himself, well, I'm having thoughts only about the worst thing that could happen, and it's making me feel even more stressed out. And then you can prompt him and coming up with other thoughts. Okay, what's the best thing that could happen here? Now, what's a more realistic thing that could happen here? And what can I tell myself to kind of get through this? Um, the next skill we're going to go through is social problem solving. So disagreements and misunderstandings with other people are inevitable. So it's very important to learn how to interact with and communicate with people so that we can keep healthy connections in our lives. A lot of times on TV and our movies, our fair characters, they're not the best at communicating directly or problem solving. And this actually makes for a great starting point for a discussion of problem solving steps. So that when the time comes that your child needs to figure out a problem in their life, they might be more willing to walk through the steps with you. So very quickly, these are the problem solving steps. One is what's my problem or what's the character's problem? What am I thinking and feeling? Second step is to brainstorm as many solutions as possible. So these can be realistic, they can be silly, kind of wacky, um, things that might make it worse, things that might make it better. And then the third step is to evaluate this, the solution. So for each solution, you're gonna think about, if I do this, then what's gonna happen? Is it gonna make my problem bigger or small, smaller? The fourth step is to pick one solution to try out based on your evaluation. And then you see if it worked. Um, at that point, you have more information. So if it didn't work out, it didn't fix your problem, maybe you can try another solution. Some of the takeaways um, when you're teaching these social problem solving skills to your child is you're trying to communicate to your child that you can't control what other people think about you, can't control what they do, but you can control what you yourself do, think, and feel. Another takeaway is that every action leads to certain consequences. So every choice has an impact and you can make different choices to kind of shift the situation more positively or negatively. Our next um, skill is managing intense, strong emotions. So a takeaway here is that it's okay to feel emotions intensely um, and stressful events in life, especially, they're gonna bring up painful and uncomfortable feelings. Usually there's these big feelings like anger at a sibling, it's gonna tell us to react immediately, just grab the toy back from them or maybe mess up their room and get them in trouble. It is possible though to do something else in the moment and get through that painful feeling maybe wait for the anger to naturally go down on its own, or maybe taking a break from the anger, and maybe we can try problem solving once we're thinking more clearly. And then the options here for these alternative activities are almost endless. It could be anything from exercising, like maybe doing as many jumping jacks as you can in a minute. Uh, maybe it's gonna do, be like a quick game and running around the backyard. It could be pleasant distraction activities, like coloring, word searches, drawing, baking. It could be self-soothing activities like taking a bubble bath, maybe cuddling a pet, maybe listening to rain or ocean waves on YouTube. So you can support your child in brainstorming options that they would like to try, maybe that they've used in the past and have been helpful for them. And then in a moment where you notice they might be feeling intensely, again, you can prompt them, remind them, okay, maybe you can go for a walk or do some belly breathing, try out some skills that we've talked about before.
And again, remember to use that specific praise when you see your child riding out and dealing with an uncomfortable emotion instead of reacting right away. The last skill we're gonna talk through today is mindfulness. So the most simple definition of mindfulness that I can give you is paying attention on purpose to the present moment and without any judgment. So the more you practice mindfulness, the stronger your mindfulness muscle is gonna become. And this can help you in identifying feelings, staying grounded in the here and now. Mindfulness, it helps you not just to recognize negative emotions and figure out what to do next, but it also highlights positive experiences in your life so that you can savor, savor them more as they happen. There are many ways to bring mindfulness into your life. So the more formal practices include doing a body scan, mindfully sitting, walking, or breathing. You can also practice mindfulness informally. So that's by bringing attention to your day-to-day -day activities. So as an example, maybe the next time you're showering, are you actually in the shower? Is it possible that you're at a friend's house and maybe replaying an argument you had with them in your head? Or maybe you're still back at work kind of thinking about your to-do list for tomorrow. In that moment, if you notice your mind drifting, just try to come back into the shower. Maybe notice the hot water. You can notice your breathing. What does it feel like to kind of massage the shampoo into my hair right now? So you can use physical sensations like breathing and also your five senses to really anchor you back into the present moment. I'm going to skip the slide due to time, um, but I will say that Child Mind Institute provides another talk on mindful parenting. And we also have resource guides on our website. There's also an abundance of information on mindfulness CZ. So feel free to do a quick Google search as well and just check out YouTube videos, books, and apps on your phone about mindfulness. Um, to wrap up the discussion on social emotional skills, I want to offer up some concrete ways of bringing these skills to life at home. So maybe you can practice some mindfulness together in your morning routine. It might be, um, let's see how many colors we can see in the living room, kind of get this day started. I find that oftentimes with morning routines, things can be really frazzled and stressed out. It might be for reading books together at bedtime, you're discussing the character's thoughts, you're validating their emotions. Maybe right before homework, you kind of do some deep belly breathing together and then jump into homework. Maybe when you're watching TV together as a family, you can talk, kind of talk about how the characters are solving problems. Are there better solutions? Are there worse solutions? You can also provide some time for journaling and self-reflection. So maybe as a family, you decide to improve a social skill each week or each month. And then you can kind of collectively discuss, okay, how do we did, how do we do as a family on this social skill? Finally, you can also um, schedule in play dates and just provide opportunities for your children to practice social skills. And it's also a chance for you to continue offering up that positive praise. Okay, so. This is the last part of our talk on stress management. Since this was covered in another talk, I'm gonna go through the slides pretty quickly. Um, it will be in the recording, but I just wanna get to our takeaways and leave plenty of time for Q&A. So remember to put your self-care first. Um, this might mean you have to schedule it in it might mean you have to assess any barriers to your self-care plan and try to maybe um, work around it. This might also mean knowing when to seek treatment and professional support um, if your self-care plan hasn't been working for a while. On this slide are some activities for self-care that might give you an idea. So it could be 
doing things in service of other people in your community. It could be fun activities, hobbies. Um, it could be learning a new skill, just jumping into something you've always wanted to do. These could be social activities, spending time with different people, and then also physical activities like exercise, any sports you're doing recreationally, any games. This slide is just a reminder that something that helps out with stress is really taking care of your physical body. Um, and then to put off any major decisions. So a lot of the times when we're stressed, we kind of feel pressure to deal with everything all at once, but it's helpful to kind of just do what you need right now to get through this moment, get through this hour, get through this evening. And then, you know, once you get a good night's rest, maybe you can think through other big decisions. And then also remember to accept help that's offered. I think a lot of times as caregivers, you want to do it all, but, um, you know, there's a support system in your life and they're, they're there to make your lives easier. So accept that when provided. And then on this slide are some more relaxation techniques. Um, and this slide is really uh, emphasizing that by taking care of your body, you're also helping calm down and take care of your mind. Okay, so I wanna end by just summarizing key takeaways from today's talk. One is that a positive relationship with your child is powerful. It can be a major protective factor for your child's mental health. So this is you strengthening the relationship through validation, through that quality one-on-one -on -one time, through modeling and praising behaviors you want, and providing lots of positive affirmation and attention. Two, um, there are steps that you can take to create safety, stability, and a positive home environment to promote overall well-being. So when, when, when you're doing this, you're keeping in mind the biological and physical health piece, and also the social relationship piece of mental health. And three, there are many ways you can promote social emotional skills at home. So at the bottom of this slide is one of our project coordinators contact information. Um, and that's if you're interested in bringing the mental health skill building curriculum to your child's school. And then finally, but perhaps most importantly, do make time for your own self care. I wanna offer an analogy that you may have heard of before. So on airplanes, before taking off, they show a safety video. And that lets you know that in the case of an emergency, oxygen masks are going to drop down from the ceiling. And in this video, they instruct you to please put your mask on first before helping other people. This makes a lot of sense because you have to be breathing well and doing OK to have the capacity and the extra energy to support other people. And while prioritizing your mental health, it's worthwhile as its own end. Just remember that saying, monkey see, monkey do. So there's the added benefit of your child also learning from you um, the importance of valuing their own self-care. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention, attention and listening this evening. I hope you learned something helpful, something practical that you can start applying in your own life. I'm gonna go through the Q&A chat now to answer your questions. So we have some questions in. Um, one of them is, is interesting. Uh, the question is, could you share a little bit more about how parents can work with children who have limited communication skills? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really great question. And it's challenging. Because um, a lot of the tips I offer were, to, were about like discussions with your child. And I think um, if your child is a school in school age, you can connect with your school and making sure they're getting services. So they're able to get speech therapy. Um, and also counseling at school for free, and that can support your child in learning some of these communication skills. Um, and then with communicating for your child, I know we 
oftentimes think a lot about verbal communication with words, but your child does communicate in other ways. So if there's a way to um, do drawings with them, play games with them, there's other ways of connecting that isn't just through words. So it takes um, more patience, more effort, and kind of learning about our child and maybe attuning to their style of expressing things. But that was such an excellent question. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I wonder if um, for children who are specifically for nonverbal children, mm -hmm. um, working with your child's teacher and their school to like figure out what are some visual aids you can apply at home. Maybe you can do an emotional scale with like little emoji faces to ask your child, how are you feeling today? You know, um, those types of tools. And we have those resources uh, on the DOE website and we can make sure we have like some printable things that folks can um, tap into for that. Um, so here's another interesting question. Um, how can you calm a child who is crying and getting anxiety at the same time? How do you teach your, t your child to calm themselves down when they have anxiety, when they are alone? So those are two questions. So I think the first one is, you know, how what can, what kind of tips can I use to to calm down my child when they're crying and feeling anxious at the same time? And I wonder, uh, I wonder if this is a little bit about prioritizing the need, right? Do we want to like bring down the anxiety before we address the crying, or uh, what are your thoughts on that, Sandy? Yeah, I'm also wondering too if like the anxiety and the crying are related. Maybe that's the way of kind of letting the anxiety out or the way it's manifesting. Um, I think in that case, if they're pretty up there in terms of emotion and dysregulated, the first thing is to kind of get them back into the present moment. So that's where those mindfulness skills and grounding them. And it's going to be a different thing for each child, but it's ideal to practice those before an anxiety moment or when they're feeling calmer. So it might be um, five, four, three, two, one. So you're using your senses, maybe like five things I can see, four things I can touch, uh, maybe three things I can hear, two things I can smell, one thing I can taste, something where they're getting back into their bodies, kind of getting back into thinking mode instead of feeling mode. And once they're able to kind of do that, it might be taking deep breaths to further help calm down their body. Um, and then at a later point in time, as they, um, you can continue to have conversations about like, oh, what was that about? What kind of triggered that? Um, maybe talk through the anxiety. So it, yeah, a great question. I hope that was helpful. I don't know, Jose, if you have more thoughts. No, I, I was thinking, in, in those situations, it's really interesting, um, the like oxygen mask analogy, because when you, you're faced with a child who's facing very severe emotions and also high anxiety, like it can be very easy for, if you're not in, in a good state of mind for you to lose control of yourself, right? So, and that, which leads me to my next question of like, what do you, we're all human, right? When we, and we're not perfect all the time. How, how should folks address when, you know, they walk into a situation with all the best intentions and do all the right things, but then just they just slip up and you know it, it, it they say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of you know we're all human, we make mistakes, so that kind of gentleness of yourself too um, is helpful. And things happen in the moment, so I would recommend that afterwards, once everyone's kind of in a more neutral place emotions aren't so high to revisit that and to own up to um, maybe you snapped, maybe you yelled at them, whatever it was, take ownership for it, apologize, and then say how you can do better or you can share like, yeah, I did that. I was really frustrated. It wasn't okay, but this is kind of how I calm myself back down. Um, and then what do you think about what I did? Kind of give them space to respond to you. Um, there's another question in here of how do you how do you deal with a child who the, is is uh, defiant even after you speak with them calmly or in a proper way like someone who's still very maybe combative or defensive um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that when kids can come off as defiant, um, there might be a history to that. It could be. Um, 
they've just been having a tough day. So you talking to them, they're just like, they're done talking for a day and they need a rest. It could be that um, there's been a lot of interactions with family recently where they feel invalidated. So they're kind of holding on to that anger and being defined as like, I don't want to talk right now. And like, you don't listen to me. So it's a way of communicating maybe how they're feeling that day. Um, so if you're able to offer empathy, like I can tell that, you know, you're talking to me with attitude. It seems like you don't really want to talk right now. Okay. Like I'm here. Let me know, you know, if you change your mind um, and kind of giving them some space and maybe revisiting things later. I'm a huge fan of a timeout in the sports sense, not in the discipline sense. So like, and sometimes in the middle of a conversation, I think it's, it's really helpful. It can be helpful if and you're in a, in like, like a combative situation where your child is just defensive to say, all right, let's take a break. Let's five minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it as well. Because I think it gives like a chance for a couple of things, right? It could give the child a chance to either self-soothe, calm down, but also organize their thoughts and be able to better communicate what they're trying to say. Also, it gives us as adults the opportunity to think and reflect on what the child is saying and see if we could like, so I'm like, when, in those situations, I'm a huge fan of a, of a timeout if it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like your explanation of the timeout and those benefits. It's kind of like a regroup, do what you need for yourself and then come back to the interaction in a clearer state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do you, how do you work with, with a child who may take a long time to answer? And I, I'm thinking of like videos that I've seen where like children are asked a very simple question and then they just go, and then, and, um, uh, uh, and then it just becomes a very long winded mm -hmm. answer that doesn't actually answer the question. Mm -hmm. right any thoughts on that yeah I um that definitely happens but I think especially with children who might be on um, the autism spectrum uh that verbal communication kind of thinking on their feet is very tough so in addition to showing patience maybe not forcing them to have like this back and forth conversation um maybe you ask the question, but you kind of give them space and time to maybe write out their thoughts, maybe journal first, maybe they want to kind of unwind and like process more slowly. So kind of letting them come to you. And um, I think they would really appreciate that, especially if words and thinking um, are challenging for them. I also think it's important for us to, in, in like those moments, to take a step back and really think about what's the question we're asking. Do we need a rephrase? Do we need to make, would you, did we ask us a, a question that has too many moving parts into it and maybe break it down into smaller questions? Um, I also think that like, that's uh, like, I, as a parent, you know your child best. And so you need to figure out like, am I actually asking the right question or, too many questions in one question, right? Um, so there's also a question in here about, is there any any guidance or any thoughts that you have on how to de-escalate a tantrum when you see it coming? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would emphasize maybe some previous answers. Maybe it's time for a timeout um, and to be very clear about that like we're gonna do three minutes on clock and you can go to your room to try to self-soothe um, try to calm themselves down through different relaxation skills um, maybe different distraction activities um, because if you continue engaging now you're adding more conflicts to it um, if they if they don't know those skills yet or they're not using the skills, you can prop them and use reminders. So it might be a verbal reminder. It might be a visual reminder of like, can you remember our belly breathing or remember our squeeze and release? Or maybe their, um, their tantrum is really like wanting to punch and kick things. So you can provide an alternative like, okay, we're gonna punch these pillars or we're gonna tear up these pieces of paper. Um, so kind of 
guiding them and using these coping skills to kind of de-escalate. So a lot of the things that we're talking about, I think automatically click for kids who have younger children, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming that all of this still applies to teenagers and adolescents. Oh, yes. <laughs> so any thoughts on how you can uh, talk to your teens about, or empower your, I would say more empower your teens and adolescents to, to express their emotions in a healthy way? Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, they, yeah, these things definitely apply to teenagers as well. Um, you know, they still love playing, they still love games. And for some of them, it's the, it could be hard to talk about your own feelings and emotions. So if there is a favorite TV show they like, maybe kind of starting those conversations around the characters and then kind of just leaving space for them to talk about their friends and maybe eventually themselves. Again, continuing that like modeling yourself of like, oh, this was my day. Um, and then leaving it open if they want to talk about their day. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to add more to that, Jose. No, I mean, if all else, all else fails, you can always bond with your teen by doing the latest TikTok dance. Um, mm -hmm. Totally joking, but absolutely try it. I don't know. Uh, Sandy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I We could go on for hours, I'm sure. Um, but I appreciate the time and all the resources you shared. Um, we're, we'll have the recording up. Um, but thank you for joining. Any, any closing thoughts from you? Um, no, I just hope that you have a wonderful rest of the evening. Um, I'm going to remind you to do self-care. And I have some words from writer Anne Lamott. So she writes that almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. And I hope everyone has a great night. There you have it, folks. Get Remember to unplug for a few minutes, uh, even if it's right before bed, right? Um, next week, uh, join us again next week. Uh, we're going to have folks from the Impartial Hearings Office who are going to talk to us about mediation and resolution meetings great ways to, to come to terms if you have a disagreement with your child's school about their IEP services. So don't miss out. But, but until then, take care of yourselves and we'll see you next week. Have a great week, everyone.